If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of John. I think this is something that everybody can and will be able to relate to. And uh, I'm excited about uh, talking to you about it. We're still talking about here on Wednesday night uh, how important it is to, to locate change in our lives. And so uh, a lot of times people want to use the grace of God as a cover-up and not understand that the grace of God doesn't cover your sin, it changes you, amen? I said the grace of God changes you. And so we've been talking about this grace-given power to change. You've always had the ability to change. It's not something that's um, impossible for you to do. You can do it. And we've given you a list of things to help you where change is concerned. Well, I think this is the fifth step for change. And tonight we're going to talk about how important it is to never go back to what God has delivered you out of. Turn to your neighbor and say, never go back. Never go back. When God makes you whole, don't go back to the thing that robbed you of that peace. So let's begin this to today in John, St. John chapter 5. Let me see if I can get you out of here before it get real cold outside. <laughs> I was cold. I wore a sweatshirt. I'm like, I apologize, but I'm cold. <laughs> All right, look at this. St. John chapter 5, and let's read uh, verses 1 through 14 because I want you to get a hold of this one character and how Jesus, what Jesus said to him, which was really, really significant. John chapter 5 and verses 1 through 14. Verse 1 says this. If you're there, say amen. He says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He says, now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind folk, halt withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at the certain season into the pool, and he troubled the water, so that whosoever then first after he troubled of the water stepped in, then he was made whole of whatsoever disease that he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? I mean, imagine 38 years in that situation. You know, some Christians have been in situations for a long time. What do we need to do so we can be made whole? And he asked him, will I be made whole? And the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. This was the week we talked about excuses. He made an excuse, and we told you that an excuse will always keep you in the season of failure. And Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Don't procrastinate. Do what you got to do and do it now. And immediately the man was made whole. So he was made whole of a 38-year infirmity. And he took up his bed and he walked on the same day it was the Sabbath. Now that's going to be a problem because on the Sabbath you're not supposed to do anything. And so he's picking his bed up and walking on the Sabbath. Now if a religious Pharisee sees them, there's going to be an issue here. He says, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. They even stoned a man under the law for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. And so he says, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed on the Sabbath. And he answered them, and, uh, and he, that made, he, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. So he says, the guy that made me whole, referring to Jesus, he was the one that told me to take my bed up and to walk. Now watch carefully, verse 12. Then asked they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? Verse 13, and he that was healed wits not who it was. He didn't know. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place, so he kind of left. But look at verse 15. Um, well, yeah. Afterwards, Jesus findeth himself in the temple. Now, this is interesting. 
Afterwards, Jesus findeth himself in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. So notice where he finds the man who was made whole. He was at church. That's where you ought to be when Jesus does something to make you whole. Amen. I say that's why you ought to be when Jesus does something that makes you whole. And he says, Behold, thou art made whole. Now notice this next statement. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto, unto thee. He says, You're made whole. Sin no more. Don't go back to what you were doing that put you in that situation in the first place, that broken situation in the first place where you had to be made whole. Don't go back to that. Turn to somebody else and say, never go back. And look at the last verses, verse 15. Um, well, the 14 was good because we're going to focus on verse 14 because he departed. But there were a couple of things we see here. Here's a man who was made whole. Here was a man that after he was made whole was found in church. Here's a man that encountered Jesus that says, don't go back to doing what got you broken in the first place. There are a lot of things that we see here uh, in this story. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said unto him, behold, thou hast been made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst, lest the worst thing come unto thee. I mean, you know, sin has consequences, right? And um, so we have to break the old habits. We've, we've, we have to get out of the old ruts in our life. If you, if you want to see change in your life, you must never go back to the way things were. There's always going to be a call to try to go back to the way things were. Perhaps you, you had been hanging around the wrong crowd and then you got away from them. But one day, all of a sudden, you start to miss their coarse jesting and you miss their dirty mouths and and, and you miss laughing and joking around, all the things that you used to do. And it was filthy, but you missed it. You forget how filthy it was. You just remember the laughter. But if you go back to those relationships, the Bible compares it like a dog returning back to his vomit. In fact, Proverbs 26 and 11 says that. Pull it up right quick. We don't want to be like a dog going back to our vomit. And I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we probably have all done it sometime in our lives where we have been delivered from something, and for some reason you found yourself going back from the, to the very thing you were delivered from. God delivered you from a crazy man, and you went back to that same crazy man. <laughs> he delivered you from a terrible situation. Why would you go back? And he describes it here. He says, as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. And I'm saying, don't return. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't return. don't return. You're like a sow returning to the mud and the mire. We've got to go forward and never go backwards if we want to see change in our lives. We've got to go forward and not go backwards if we want to see change in our lives. Uh, what is it? Uh, look at Philippians, I believe, chapter... See if I can find it. Three, Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. We've got to go forward. We've got to go forward. We can't go backwards. We never go back to the old relationships. We don't go back to the old way of thinking. We don't go back to the old way of looking. We don't go back to the old way of, of, of acting. We never go back to find the old things in our closet. We want to, to get rid of those old things. We want to go forward. Now look what he says in verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. You know, out of all the things I know that we can do, Paul zeroed it down to this, just this one thing I know I do. I'm forgetting those things which are behind me. Here's one thing I know I do. I'm forgetting the things that are behind me, and I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before me. How many of you know if you don't let go of the things that are behind you, it is going to greatly challenge those things that are before you? I'm telling you, man, it's, it's just certain things. Don't allow the devil to sit there and take you through 
a dramatized version of all of your mistakes. That's not you anymore, and you don't go back. You don't go back. No, it don't look good, but you don't go back. All of us have a past. We just don't live there anymore. Ah, that's good stuff right there. We all have a past. We don't live there. He says, I don't count myself to have already obtained or apprehended. He said, but there's one thing that I do, which to me, when you're living this life as a Christian, the enemy is going to attack you all the time in one place, right up here. If he can affect how you think, he will affect how you live. For as a man thinketh, then in his heart, so is he. If he can affect how you think, he can affect how you live. So that's why the most powerful thing you can do as a Christian is to renew your mind, renew the way you think. Don't go back. Sometimes it feels like it's easier to go back because of the challenges that await you by going forward. Satan don't want you to reach this place of destiny. He don't want you to reach this, reach this place where you've been called, this place where, you're, where you've been anointed, this place where where, you know, you, you couldn't see it, but once you got there, you had no idea that look at where God wanted me to be. And Paul describes it like this. He says, I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before. Here's how he describes how that process is going to be. Verse 14, I press. I press towards that mark. You have to press towards that mark. And when you press towards something, it's always because opposition faces you. You press towards it regardless of what's coming your way. You press towards, I am going forward. And sometimes it, it may be just a little forward. You remember when Jesus, went in the garden, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the great torment in the garden was, was on him to the point where he began to sweat blood. Somebody says, well, what do you do when it gets that rough? The stress of all of what he's getting ready to go to to become uh, the, the, the sin offering for mankind. What did he do? The Bible says he prayed and he went forward. He went forward. There are a lot of things that are going to confront you, and those things are designed to paralyze you. Those things are designed to keep you thinking that that's where you're supposed to be all of your life. But I'm telling you, I believe there's a press on the inside of everybody in here. Amen. There's still a press on the inside. And even if you don't go but a little bit forward, praise God, you're not in the exact same place you were in before. Amen. He says, I press towards the mark for the prize of that high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus. We all have a high calling. That is the very purpose and reason for which God has allowed us to be on this planet. And sometimes you can't get satisfied for where, you know, you know, concerning where you are. It's bigger than where you are right now. I can say with confidence that it's bigger than where all of us are right now. I feel like we're getting ready to put a press on right now, a full court press on anything that the enemy brings our way, and we're going to say, no, we're not staying the same. There's something greater. There's a high call. There's a prize that's waiting on us, and I'm going to get my prize, praise God. I am not going back. You ain't in high school no more. You ain't going back to that. You ain't going back to that. Some of the stuff you just ought to be blessed that God delivered you out of because you can't keep, a lot of times when people go through real crazy stuff, it's because they keep flirting with their past. It's time to leave it. Excuse my English, but that ain't you no more. Quit flirting with the old you, the new you trying to stand up and take you to that place of the high call. Man, I'm going to give myself an offering. I ain't got nothing. I'm doing everything electronically. I'm going to send something to myself. Amen. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So if you say, okay, from this day forward, I'm not going to eat such and such anymore, then, then don't eat it anymore. Don't say, oh, but I just can't help myself. I got to have that sugar. No, don't eat it. Don't go back. Don't go back. I've seen people get in, into adultery and destroy their families because they've gotten close to someone at work. And, and what you don't understand is intimacy is a very, very important thing. It's, it's a matter, once you're married, who you decide to become intimate with. Listen to me carefully. Intimacy is the invitation to invite somebody to come in and to see something that should only be seen. It's just something that everybody shouldn't see. 
come in to me and see. They're, 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 you don't let the whole world see some things, and then you have a circle you let people see, and then there's certain things that in a marriage that only you and your, your spouse should see, intimacy. And somebody says, well, you know, I just, I just feel comfortable talking to this person. You know, if you're a woman, you know, I, t I talk to this man. We're not doing anything wrong. We just go eat. It's the same lunch that everybody else. We're not doing anything. Yeah, you know, what you're doing is you're letting them come into you and see something that should be reserved for your spouse to come in to see. Yeah, you know, some people call this emotional adultery. Isn't that right? Emotional adultery. It's where you have allowed intimacy to take place where it begins to impact you emotionally. And then you have a grudge against your spouse because you don't know why they're not responding to you that way. And you don't realize you've not ever allowed them that opportunity to be that intimate. You didn't let them in to see that. You let somebody else in to see that. And what happens is, you know, if you're not careful, then eventually it's going to end up into a physical relationship because that's what real intimacy is about. If you feel it's a safe place to talk to this person that you think is safe to talk to them instead of your wife or your husband, then all of a sudden you become vulnerable around those people. And then once you become vulnerable around people, then real intimacy takes place. And sometimes real intimacy is more dangerous than a sexual encounter because it involves your emotions. You let somebody else in. Your emotions are all tied to that kind of thing. That's the very thing we try to counsel people in marriage. We try to say to married people, there's got to be a safe place in order for there to be vulnerability. And then once you become vulnerable, then you enter into intimacy. And once you have real intimacy, you don't ever have to worry about the things that follow that because that becomes the springboard into all types of wonderful things where marriages are concerned. But sometimes people, you know, they neglect that whole deal. And they decide, well, I want to I wanna go back and continue to talk. They don't recognize this is not good. You go back and you want to continue to talk to that person. Uh, you want to continue to tell them how you feel about something when your wife does this, when you need to be telling your wife how you feel about that. Nobody else needs to have the invitation to come in and see something about your wife. And then when your wife meets her, she knows more about how you feel about her than the wife does. That's, that's spelling trouble. And uh, the result of that is going to be an affair. It's going to be, you know, uh, you know, all kinds of weird stuff uh, because you allowed that to take place. Uh, and you've got to make sure that doesn't take place. You've got to rid yourself of that. You can go around and say, I've never committed adultery. I never had sex. And you think it's, I've never committed adultery. I never had sex. But it's something worse. You allowed yourself to develop a relationship with someone that you invited in to see something. And that's going to take you to places that you need to go. Well, we're just good friends. I told my wife when I got married, got married she had this guy. She said, we've been friends all y'all all your life. I said, I'm sorry. That, that, that's got to be over with. That's got to be over with because I don't want him knowing more about you than I know about you. And in them days, she used to wear these little cut-off shirts and these little short shorts. I said, no, you can't be hanging around, around him doing that. And I told him, I said, I don't feel comfortable with you hanging around here. I said, because you a dude, you a man. Don't be come talking about you ain't looking. <laughs> them big pretty legs, and you ain't looking, you lying. Where you, where you, where you been telling? Oh, me and Paul went out of Y'all went out the well? <laughs> Dinner. Ain't you dating me? Oh, yeah, but we friends. Oh, we're going to have to change that. <laughs> and, and my fear was, are you going to let him in to see something that you hadn't let me in to see? Intimacy. It's a strong, powerful thing. And if that has always been something that has cause problems in your relationship, don't go back to it. Make your mind up that there are certain things that are only going to be shared within the context of my marriage, my family, my church. There are certain things I share with you that I don't feel comfortable sharing with the whole world. And then sometimes I forget the internet's on and it's like the whole world. <laughs> Amen. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, 
John 5, 14, let's focus in on this now. And he says, and finding him in the temple, Jesus said to him, you have been made well, stop sinning so that nothing worse happens to you. In other words, your lifestyle didn't prevent your miracle. Obviously, he was sinning before that, or Jesus wouldn't have said, you got to, don't go back to it. So his sinning lifestyle didn't prevent his miracle. But if you don't live a new way, things are going to get worse, is what he says. Isn't that interesting? Your lifestyle didn't prevent your miracle, but if you keep going back, things are going to get worse. That, that's powerful to me. You, you can't say that, you know, whatever you were doing stopped your miracle. This guy was doing something and still got the miracle. And when he got the miracle and got whole, he was in church. And Jesus says, don't go back. Don't go back or you're going to cause something worse to happen. Now, somebody says, well, I thought I was under grace. Under grace, you got your miracle. But in the world, you're going to make stuff worse because sin has consequences. Like I said, grace is not going to give you an open opportunity to just go do stupid stuff. Stupid stuff in this world becomes a part of the law that says, while the earth remains, sin, time, and harvest. See, excuse me, sin, sin, time. That's about right. Seed, time, and harvest shall not cease. And so there are consequences. I mean, you know there's consequences for sin, right? There's consequences for sin. But it won't stop your miracle from Jesus. But there are consequences for sin. And I think people, they kind of, don't get that. Don't go back. If, if, if the mercy of God showed up and you didn't get the bad you deserve, thank God, show up at church, and don't go back. <laughs> Amen. Be grateful. There were a plethora of things that could have happened to you that thank God because of his mercy, it didn't happen to you, and you ought to give God some praise for that and thank him that it didn't happen to you. It could have. It could have. You could have been dead, shot, beat up, all kinds of stuff. It didn't happen. Don't keep flirting around with your past. Never go back. Now, it's interesting to note here that Jesus is now controlling, or excuse me, he's, he's confronting this man about his sin. He never brought it up when he healed him. Not one time did he bring his sin up when he healed him because God wants us to understand that we cannot earn our healing through our holiness. We cannot earn our healing through our holiness. And, and so many people are trying to still earn what grace has made available through their behavior. You can't, he didn't earn his healing because he was holy. He earned his healing because he believed Jesus. And, and thank God we're, we're healed because we believe Jesus. We're delivered because we believe Jesus. We're blessed because we believe Jesus. Amen? Praise God. So I think that believers often feel that they cannot receive anything from God until they get all the sin out of their lives. And while I am not endorsing keeping the sin in your life, the two are often unrelated. Since Jesus told him to stop sinning after he healed him, then we can know that sinlessness is not a prerequisite to our healing. Belief is. Boy, I know that's rough for some people to hear. I mean, I've heard it a long time in my Christian life. The reason why you didn't get healed is because of the sin in your life. No, the reason why you didn't get healed is because you fell from grace and then you started trying to earn it through your behavior and how you carry yourself. Jesus will help you to not go back. He'll help you to walk away from sin. He'll help you to walk away from some of the things that you struggle with in your life. He will do that. But that is not a prerequisite for any of the finished works of Jesus Christ. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Now, having said that, Jesus understands the law of seed time and harvest, and whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. So although the man's faith and action brought about the miraculous power of God in order to preserve his healing, he was going to have to change. He was going to have to change whatever he was doing that was opening the door to this previous 38-year condition. 
And I think a lot of times Christians need to understand that you can get healed one day and walk right back through the door of what caused this thing, and it's right there again. And sometimes it can be natural things. It could be your diet. It could be your stress level. It could be the decisions you make. It can be all of those things. Make sure you come out of every bad situation with, with wisdom. Right. Understand what happened so that you won't go back to it. Understand why it happened. I, you know, every time there's a, you know, uh, I, I do a, a male physical panel every year, which looks at everything. It looks at everything that you can possibly look at. And I pay attention to those numbers. And when those numbers are high, I need to evaluate what is it that I was doing. I need to get an explanation. Why was that number high? I was doing something I didn't need to do. Um, I'm, I'm stressed out. And you know, stress isn't the most dangerous thing in the world because when you're stressed out, it closes your cells. And even though you may be doing healthy things, they can't penetrate cells because they're shut down through the stress. Cortisol is released in your body, all kinds of the wrong type of hormones. And so I've had to confront myself after all these years and I've got to let some stuff go. I, I cannot at this rate continue to do what I was so easily doing before. I, I can't. I can't do it. So, you know, soon I'll introduce you to our new CEO who's come in and taken over, and he'll be taking over all the stuff that I've done uh, for the past 37, 38 years. And I am going to return to the role of pastoring, and they're, he's going to run all that other stuff. I mean, it's just, I, I, I can't do it. And somebody said, oh, no, you're going to go back. No, I'm not because they're all of the indications physically saying, you're done with this. You somebody else, I prepared somebody else to do it. You got a team to do it. You're going to either have to step away or you're going to kill yourself and get back to a, a worse situation than it was before. And I ain't never going back to that. Amen. You understand? And on a natural, practical sense, what are some things that you are doing that God made you whole from, and you recognize those doors that you've walked through to cause that situation, but you ignore them. You're ignoring them. You're not paying attention to them. And then you get in a box, and I have to come and bury you, and I'm not the kind of preacher that has searches for excuses for why you're in that box. I just go with what I know. You're saved and you're in heaven. I ain't talking about all the stuff you because I don't know. I ain't live with you. I don't know what you did. When I see you, it's praise the Lord, hop, hop, hallelujah. You're not telling me what you're eating, how stressed out you are, how many arguments you have, what your kid did, did they cuss you out the night before that, what, what hurt, what happened. I, you, I, you, I don't know none of that. But all I'm saying is you are not, you are not, please do not allow yourself to live in a life of distress and you don't have no room to take somebody's drum in to stress you out. The word of the Lord came to tell one woman, Tend to your own business. I said, amen, because you ain't got room to be tending to somebody else's business. You only got room for your own stress. You ain't got room for all everybody else's stress. Tell people one time, they decided what they're going to do. Praise the Lord, you grown. That's why grown folks can't live together. Daddy, can I move on? No, grown folks can't live together. You go talk to your uncle or some, 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 somebody who's lonely, ain't got nobody. We ain't going to do. No, you come set in your ways and all that stuff. Well, you just selfish. <laughs> After raising you, I got a right to be as self-centered as I want to be. Well, the Lord working on me. Amen, Jesus. He helping me. Praise the Lord. Don't do it, guys. I've seen so many people destroyed because they allow themselves to keep going back to the same stress. That's huge. That may be the number one killer. Don't do it. There's things you're supposed to do. Don't go back to the stress. Look at what you're eating. Don't become a slave to food. Push back on some stuff that you really want. Look at what you're smoking. Look at what you're drinking and how often you're drinking it. Pastor, you know who you're talking to? Yeah, I know who I'm talking to. <laughs> Value your peace. Receive the peace of God. Thank him for being whole. Every morning you get up and don't, don't have no worry. Thank God that you woke up in peace. Go to bed in peace. Live in peace. And the God of peace 
will be with you. You know what peace means? It's, it's translated the same. It's the same word, wholeness. Be whole. Don't go back to the things that cause you to be broken. Don't go back to relationships that cause you to be broken. Your children grow up. Your parenting is over. So don't try to be the parent you were when they were 12. They're 35 now. It's a whole different relationship. You can't tell them what to do. They're 35. You can offer advice and back up. And the rest of the time, you pray. But you don't get mad and get strife because they didn't do what you recommended. I love you, baby. Keep living. But you ain't going to get on my nerve. Got to go now. Bye. Yeah, but I ain't finished the conversation. I don't want to talk about it no more. Bye. And then I use that anointed thing on my phone called block. <laughs> you know why y'all laughing, right? Because I'm, 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 I'm in your house now. Turn to two people and tell them, never go back. And that's a decision of quality. I believe that, that you have to make. You have to make that decision of quality. He never brought it back up. That was so, so awesome. So I think that believers often feel that they cannot receive anything from God until they get rid of the sin. I don't, I don't think that's correct. So having said that, Jesus understands these things. He understands all of those things that we talked about. So here's this guy in this previous condition, 38 years. And even though he was healed, Jesus wanted him to know that there was something worse than having that sickness. It's having the consequences of bad decisions in our lives. Having the consequences of bad decisions in our lives. If you pay attention, the Holy Spirit will help you. Is that's a bad decision. You've done that before. How much, how many more times are you going to open yourself up into that? We see a significant change in this man's life who was healed by Jesus. And after being healed, where do we find this guy? After he was healed, he's in the temple. He's in the church. He's learning a new way of thinking and a new way of seeing himself. He's not hanging around with the same crowd or the same, uh, hanging around the same pool even. He's now in God's house. He's now identifying with that new life. And so he realized that the place to be was in the house of God where he could hear the life-changing word that would empower him to become a victor rather than a victim. And God has been so good to you. God was has been so good to me. And you know what I say when God's been good to you? Now change. Now change. Use that goodness as motivation to go ahead and change. So what does this look like? What does this change look like practically? I'll give you these four things and I'll let you go. Number one, plant different seeds than the ones you've planted. I don't know whether the, the action was the seed. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about what, what kind of seed, what kind of attitude, what kind, plant different things, do different things than what you, 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 you've been planting before. Don't plant the same seeds of hate and disgust and all, plant different seeds than you, than you did before. This is what this change and never looking back practically looks like. Number two, develop new relationships with people who will support and reinforce your change. Develop new relationship with people, people who will support and reinforce your change. Don't keep hanging around with the same old dude who calls the same old thing all the time. Sometimes you, watch this, sometimes you got to cut, cut some, you got to cut some relationship. You got to recognize when you're in a toxic relationship. Here's the first thing you can recognize in a toxic relationship. When people are taking advantage of you rather than giving the advantage to you, that's a sign it's a toxic relationship. They're not really interested in giving you the advantage. They're only interested in how they can take advantage from you. It's a toxic relationship. And for whatever reason that you feel like you want to stay stuck when all of the signs are indicating this is just not a good relationship for me, now, now you're, you're questioning your value. You're questioning how you see yourself. I mean, 
How is it that you can remain in a situation where somebody abuses you emotionally, abuses you physically, they're not concerned about giving you the advantage ever, and you want to stand the emotions, you want to stay in a relationship because you like the way somebody look? Boy, you better go find you a good old black dolo, Mike. <laughs> No, I, I, I'd rather be with somebody that don't look too good, but they're good for me. Because, listen to me, when intimacy takes place, they're going to look good to you. Amen. See, we got to get rid of that benefit motive. We got to find people that are going to build us up, that are going to reinforce who we are. Why would you want to marry somebody that doesn't believe in your Jesus? The only thing they're going to do is work overtime to try to get you to believe the way they believe. Find somebody. Develop a relationship with people who will support and reinforce your change. Support and reinforce your change. Now, I know some of you look at me like, I ain't going to do it. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you one or two times, and <laughs> that's it. And when you get to heaven, I say, well, how was the last 10 years of your life? Pastor, it was hell. I said, you didn't do what I told you to do. Did you? No, I didn't. I should have. <laughs> Number three, I know this is going to be foreign. Get in the temple and learn to walk with God. It's like what you're doing tonight. Where, where's everybody else? You're in the temple learning how to walk with God. This is, this is the place you come to learn how to walk with God. This is not the place we come to, to play church. It's not the place we come so we can do cartwheels and flips. And it's, it's the place where we come to learn how to walk with God. That's why we've been putting a lot of emphasis on relationship. Make that decision. Get in the temple. Get in this place where you learn to walk with God. And how are you going to ever be learning how to walk with God? If I keep getting up and feeding you popcorn messages and, and, and playing church and all that kind of stuff, it's a level of information that has, needs to be shared, teaching and, and training that we got to share. And, and your life begins to change because you're here learning how to walk with God. And then the last one, change the way you think and you'll change the way you live. Change the way you think and you will change the way you live. This was such a revelatory statement in my life where if I can change how I think, I change how I live because how I live is based on my thinking. What I expose myself to determines the way I think. What I expose myself to determines the way I think, and the way I think determines how I feel. But if I can change the way I think, I'll change how I feel. I'll change what I do. I'll change my actions. I will change my destination. If I can change the way I think, don't you understand? That's the battleground. Everything about your life, it starts with Satan trying to influence you through some type of image, something he can expose you to. What can I expose you to that will impact your thinking? Or what, what, can, what can I keep you ignorant of that will impact your thinking? Because if you can, if you can change your thinking, you change your life. That's what happens when you come to church. It's what happens when you come to Bible study. That's what happens when you're committed to a study of God's Word. It changes the way you think, and then your life changes. You're not thinking like that anymore. And when you change the way you think, you change the way you believe. And when you change the way you believe because you change the way you think, because you're changing what you're exposing yourself to, man, your life changes. Your life changes, man. You do things differently. But it, start, it starts right here. It starts right here. And in your mind... Never go back to that way of thinking. Never go back to that way of thinking. Now, I know you're human, and you might fall back into some things. Just don't stay there. Don't stay there. Definitely don't live there. If you have a bad day, make sure I ain't doing that today. <laughs> keep going. Keep pressing. Because your life's changed. Your thinking's changed. You have a relationship with God. All is well. You will change. You will be like this guy who started off making a bunch of excuses but ended up in church. He started off making excuses, started off procrastinating, started off with no desire to change, but he ended up in church when he saw wholeness taking place 
in his life. And I believe you have the grace to change. You've always had the grace to change. You, you are not powerless, and you don't have to remain the same. And boy, I prophesy over you this time next year, yes. you might have to ask yourself what your name is. <laughs> Who is this I see in the mirror? Yes. I believe that. I believe that there is a, uh, what did I call it this morning, a switcheroo? <laughs> I don't know if that was this morning or last week. I remember. God is doing something. It, it, the first is going to be last. The last is going to be first. And we are we're going to walk in an authentic demonstration of the blessing. You are blessed. Amen? Amen. You learned anything tonight? Amen. Well, apply it, apply it, apply it. Okay. This is the time we're going to worship God Amen. with our finances. We read a scripture this morning in morning Bible study about the Magi. I think it was Matthew 2:11 how they saw the star in the east, and they came before Jesus. And the Bible says that when they saw him, they fell down to their knees. They worshiped him when they opened up the treasury. Oh, my God. When they opened their treasures, that's, he says, they, they fell down, they worshiped him when they opened up their treasury. That's what we're doing right now. We're opening up our treasury. <laughs> And we're going to worship him with our, our gifts, our gifts. Your money is your gift to God. And your giving causes you to remember. It causes you to remember that you're already blessed. It causes you to remember all the mercy that God showed you, all the grace that he showed you. It causes you to remember. Remember every ditch he delivered you out of. Remember every favor he performed. Your worship will never be genuine without the, present, the, pre, the, the presenting of the gift. And that's what we're doing right now. So let's prepare your gifts. As we prepare to go worship before the Lord, if you're giving by text, let, let your phone be a representation of what you're giving. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands and the ushers will do it. It seems like the more we do this, the more we are sensing the presence of the Lord because we are genuine worshipers. And I'll teach on this Sunday. I shared a little bit this morning how uh, Abram gave his son Isaac as a gift. The sacrifice was the gift. And the Bible says that Abraham told the guys that came with him, he said, the, the lad and I, we're going to go and worship God. I was thinking, oh my God, why did they say that? Because they're present, he's presenting Isaac as a gift to God. And all kinds of wonderful things uh, happen doing that. We'll talk about that later. But take your gifts and hold it up right now. Father, we come before you and we worship you with our gifts. We're not giving to get blessed. We're giving because we're already blessed. And Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that this comes up as a sweet odor a sweet smell that is well-pleasing unto you, that we finally know what to do with our gifts. It's not to manipulate you. It is to worship you. And so our gift is, is our gratitude. Our gift is our thanksgiving. Our gift is our appreciation. Our gift is our worship. It is what we are giving as creations of yours to you, our God, our great creator, who is like unto thee, O God, nobody. And we worship you for every time you've delivered us. We worship you for every time you healed us. We worship you for the forgiveness and the shedding of your blood. We worship you because you said we're blessed and we didn't have to earn it, but we received it by faith. We worship you because you gave us Jesus and in him we move and in him we breathe and in him we have our very being. We worship you because of the finished works of Jesus Christ. And we worship you, Lord, because we've been made righteous, that we've been redeemed, that we have the wisdom of God that we're holy right now. Glory to God, and we worship you for all that you've already done. And Lord, if you don't do anything else for us, you've already done enough for us to lift our hands up and to lift our gift up before you and to give you praise. Hallelujah. And we bring this gift before you, God, and we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. And we didn't come empty-handed because this is not our exchange for what 
you can bless us with, but it is our exchange of gratitude and thanksgiving for what you've already done. We are blessed, we receive it, and Lord, we give it all to you. All glory to you, O oh God, for the mighty things that you have done. Let your anointing and let your presence become more real and more evident that we all experience the Shekinah glory of the Lord like never before. Your presence that almost feels like it's tangible and touchable. We praise you for that now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Sometimes you don't even want to come out of that, man. You know what I'm saying? Oh, glory, 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 glory. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, 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 glory. Give your offerings and pray in the Holy Ghost with me for a moment. The Bible says we offer perfect thanks, praying in the Holy Ghost. Maklan Rusli Christi to Vrisit Roko Ranelia Toma Million Dolores Lay La Candela Brus Vrisro Ricraturi Tiki Liguro Bando Laba O Matisla Nube Keso Coca Landi Rutosu Ladaba Rasota Ladaba Moho Shelleri Atata Oh Lord, thank you Lord. Thank you Lord that this people's blessed. Thank you their families are blessed. Thank you, their relationships are blessed. Thank you that they walk in peace and no stress. Glory to God. Thank you that doors are open, that no man could have opened it, but you opened it, Father. And we give you praise, Lord. You're the God of the turnaround, oh God. And we place you as first place in our lives. And we'll never put something that's second or third or fourth in your place. You are priority. Jesus, you are our blessing. You are our blessing. We receive that now. Oh my God, we just worship you. It ain't. When we believe the way we believe, Lord, ain't nothing else to do but worship you. Yeah, when we believe we already have what we're going to ask about, we ain't nothing else to do but worship you. When we believe you've already taken care of us and you're our supply house and you're our healer and our deliverer, there's nothing left to do but to worship you. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. Wow, Jesus. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. This is not a waste of time. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, their pleasures forevermore. We're seeking his face. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I tell you, this very presence, this very presence is going to change people in your family. You, you, you know it's, it's virtually impossible for you to hang around worshiping God, tasting his presence over and over again, and it not get on you. I mean, I feel the Holy Ghost all... You not get on you. You, you. I'm telling you, I've said this to you before, I'll say it again. Your presence is going to start demanding an explanation. People are going to turn around, who that? What's going on? You cannot spend so much time in the presence of the Lord and it not rub on you. And I just feel like that's what's happening. I, whew. Whew. I can't ex... And it's real, and it's not fake, and it's not something generated by my emotions. It's a heart change. I almost said a transplant. God is good. And you ain't never going to run out of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're never going to run out of it. You can run out of money. You can run out of, out of, out of a job. 
You can run out of a lot of benefits, but you ain't never going to be able to run out of God. Man, can you get up and finish this thing, man? I'm, I'm like, I'm like, you know, my eyes bucked. I'm like, shoot, I'm ready for part two, boy. What's going on? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. When you think about the goodness of the Lord, goodness and God go hand in hand. Goodness and God. What did I say? I said, you remember the original rule? The original rule said, uh, good master and God. And Jesus said, why, why you call me, why you call me good? He said, there's nobody good but God. In other words, he says, why don't you call me God if you say I'm good? Because you can't talk about good without talking about God. Because all good things come from God. So if anything good is happening in your life, he gets the glory. He gets the praise. He is good. Hallelujah. Oh, I, I feel Baptist. Baptist leaking, not me, bro. I want. Woo Woo. Come on, come on now. Come on. How how good has God been to you? Sometimes we just need to stop and reflect just for a minute and realize how good God has been to us. And we we, we need to imagine that if God would not have caused me to stop just a second sooner then I might have stepped out there and that car might have hit me. Or if he didn't cause for this money to show up right at this time, I might have been put out. It's just so many things God has done for us. He's been so good to us. Come on, let's give him praise one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, listen, I, it's not my position to preach, but I know that the word has come forth and it has ministered to somebody out there. The Spirit of God has followed and sat upon his word, and this word has settled in your heart, and God is speaking to some of you all right now, and he's saying, now is the time. Now is the day. Don't ignore me. As I said before, God's been tapping you on the shoulder. God's been whispering in your ear. God's been trying to wink at you. He's been trying to get your attention. Listen. That's one person you don't want to ignore. If God has been speaking to you, God, if God has been talking to you, come on down. Meet him. He has so much for you. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you want to step into this fold, you want to join the sheep sheepfold and become a part of this great army, amen. Listen, we will never, our membership will never get so large that we can't accept more, amen. So we accept more into this family. If you believe that God is speaking to you about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, come on down, let's receive that. Or if you believe that God has called you to join this family, this church, a group of believers that we are learning, we're growing, we're expanding, we're, we're falling in love with Jesus every day, come on and join the group, amen? So I'm gonna ask that everybody stand up, turn to your left, right, front, behind, and minister those three things to those around you. Come on down, listen, if God has already spoken to you, you ain't gotta wait for somebody to tell you, just come on down and let's join in.
made that decision and has come and they come on this side of heaven. Praise God. And look at your neighbor and say, I ain't going back. Amen. Praise God. Listen, if there are any of you all who are watching via uh, online or in our e-church and, and maybe you hadn't made that decision to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, listen, we believe that now is the day, now is the time. Go ahead on and accept him. Just say, Lord, I believe that you are my God. I, I come before you now and I confess my sins. And Lord, I thank you that you have healed me and you have delivered me from all my sins and I receive you as Savior and I receive you as Lord. Lord, right now in Jesus name amen praise God listen there are many of them out there who've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior but us who are here right now we thank God for the Word of God that our man of God brought let's lift our hands get ready to close out now to him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory majesty dominion and power both now and forever in Jesus name amen God bless you have a good night are you ready to end the year with a bang? Join us on December 31st, 2019 with Pastors Creflo and Taffy Dollar for the biggest celebration of the year. We welcome you to bring in the year 2020 with us at World Changers Church International. Get ready for a night filled with fun, power-packed praise, and a life-changing word from Dr. Creflo Dollar. Our special guest artist will be Grammy-nominated Canton Jones performing live. Doors will open at 9 p.m. and service will begin at 10 p.m. This event is absolutely free. Visit worldchangers.org for more information. We can't wait to see you there. This is an awesome experience. We are a team. It's yeah. amazing. You've not been called to be ordinary, but extraordinary. Ladies, are you ready to find your worth? Join us at the 2020 Worth Radical Women's Conference, March 19th through the 21st at World Changers Church International and learn just how valuable you are. Once you find out your worth, you will stop giving out discounts. Join Taffy Dollar, Creflo Dollar, Sarah Jakes Roberts, Dee Dee Freeman, and special musical guests Todd Delaney, Miranda Curtis, and Demita Chandler. Mark my words, this is going to be epic. Join us for three life-changing days at the 2020 Radical Women's Conference, March 19th through the 21st. Reserve your seat today at taffydollar.org or text RADICAL to 51555. Join us for the biggest event of the year. The 2020 Change Experiences are coming to a city near you. Join Pastors Creflo and Taffy Dollar in Trinidad, Tobago, Birmingham, England, Cleveland, Ohio, Dallas, Texas, Chicago, Illinois, and Birmingham, Alabama. You don't want to miss this power-packed event. For more information, visit CreflodollarMinistries.org. See you there. Can't make it to service? No problem. Join our online worldwide audience. Experience the same atmosphere of praise, worship, and teaching of God's Word from any mobile or smart device via our website. It is not a blessing to go around broke, busted, and disgusted. It is not a blessing to go around sick, 
with cancer, about to die. It is not God's will for you to die. You can leave here when you get ready to go, praise God. That's the blessing of the Lord. Long life. Every mistake that you've ever made, every shortcoming that you've ever experienced, it is under the blood of Jesus. And Jesus is how God sees us. He sees us through his blood. We're excited that you've decided to stay involved as we continue our mission to flood this world with the gospel of grace and empower change in the lives of people all over the world. Calling all world changers, family and friends. Join us February 2020 at the World Dome to help us celebrate 34 years. That's right, it's that time again. It's our church anniversary. Join pastors Creplo and Taffy Dollar as we celebrate this monumental moment in time. Woo! Shout amen, somebody. Our special guest speaker will be the one and only John Gray. Also, get here early for a one-time only very special musical performance from our very own senior pastor, Dr. Creflo Dollar. Visit worldchangers.org for more information. Join us Christmas morning at 10 a.m. for a very special holiday service. There will be games, giveaways, special performances, and so much more. Service will only be one hour long, so get there early. For more information, call 770-210-5700. Text to Give with SecureGive is a fast, easy way to give from anywhere, anytime. It's just two quick steps. First, text the keyword followed by the amount you'd like to give to your church's Text to Give phone number. Then when asked to confirm, just text Y and your transaction is complete. That's all there is to it. Text to Give, the fastest, easiest way to give on the go. Are you interested in volunteering? We are looking for you. The media department is now accepting new volunteers passionate about video shooting, being a part of our nationwide broadcast pre or post production, photography, acquisitions, lighting, streaming, audio, and so much more. To get information or to sign up, call 770-210-5753 or contact J.E. Pinkston at worldchangers.org. We can't wait to hear from you.